Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'll give folks a few seconds to trickle in and, and grab some notepads, coffee, water, whatever you need to make yourself feel comfortable for the next hour. Really looking forward to today's conversation. If you're just joining us, I'm just gonna um, pause a few seconds to let some folks trickle in, make themselves feel comfortable, grab whatever you need in the meantime. Good morning, folks. I hope everyone's having a uh, restful Tuesday morning. We're going to get started shortly, just giving folks a few more seconds to get settled in. Okay, welcome everyone. Some folks still trickling in, so we'll get started uh, very shortly. Thank you for your patience. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's business support series webinar. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us today. My name is Josh Creighton. I am the corporate partnership specialist and your host this morning. Sorry, the corporate partnership specialist here with the chamber, as well as your host this morning. It's African Heritage Month, if you haven't noticed, uh, here in Nova Scotia and around the world. And with our province's rich history of African Nova Scotians dating back over 400 years, we have such so much to celebrate, so much to celebrate, so much to honor, and so much to learn. As part of the Halifax Chamber's DEA and I Action Plan, we host frequent educational events on topics relating to diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. Today is one of those webinars. <clears throat> And today's topic is on the concept of intersectionality and how important it is to everyone's DEA and I work. On that note, I'm excited to introduce our speaker today, Kendall Darling from Open Floor Consulting and co-founder of Pilot X Technologies. Kendall works in diversity, equity, and inclusion and is going to walk us through the intersectionality today and how businesses can use it to strengthen their practices. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions for our presenter. When we get to the Q&A portion of the webinar, feel free to type any other questions in the chat box. And without further ado, welcome Kendall, and thank you for coming today. I'll pass it thank over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Josh. <laughs> so today, as Josh said, uh, we're exploring intersectionality in DEI. I am a consultant with um, Open Floor. We are a new uh, um, DEI consultancy firm. So here are some learning objectives for today. So the first one, we are going to learn the origins of intersectionality. Uh, the second one, learn to meaningfully implement intersectionality in your current DEI agenda. So here are some of our some of my teammates at Open Floor. 
So Open Floor Consulting Group works with organizations who are brave enough to start transforming their workplaces. Made up of three industry professionals with lived experience, Open Floor is on a mission to change the way DEI work is currently being done. So with that being said, we're gonna go right into it and start with the history of intersectionality. So um, in you know, the past few years, we've been seeing the word intersectionality pop up everywhere. Some people even calling it a buzzword. There's so much confusion and misrepresentation about the history and the real meaning behind what intersectionality is. Today, we'll be clarifying this. The theory of intersectionality was coined by American scholar and civil rights advocate, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. In her research article in, 18, in 1989, demarginalizing the intersection of race and sex, it was used to describe how race, gender, class, and other human characteristics are interconnected. In Crenshaw's 1989 paper, the paper evaluates three legal cases that dealt with racial and gender discrimination. So one of the most well-known case was Dengrafenid versus General Motors. So I'm gonna give you a little backstory of it. So the backstory of G the GM case was that it was a group of black women that were laid off at GM because uh, they were performing a seniority layoff during a recession in 1976. So black women were not hired by GM until 1964. So the majority of new hires were black women. Thus, they would be the first group to be laid off. This group of black, five black women filed a lawsuit stating that this was a form of discrimination. So uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, she went on to um, explain that due to a very narrow view of uh, discrimination at that time, this lawsuit did not fall under just gender or race discrimination. The judges stated that binding together both racial and gender discrimination is not feasible. In Kimberly Crenshaw's article, she argued that, and I quote, treating black women as only black or only women, that the courts completely ignore the unique challenges that black women face as a group. Crenshaw explained, and I quote, courts seem to think that race discrimination is what happened to all black people across gender and sex discrimination was what happened to all women and if that is your framework of course what happens to black women and other women of color is going to be difficult to see end quote a few years before the term intersectionality was coined by dr crenshaw in the early 1970s during the feminist movement that occurred in the 60s and 70s, a group of black feminists started meeting together and created the Combehe River Collective. This organization was formed due to them arguing that the current white feminist movement and civil rights movements were not addressing their needs as black women and black lesbians. In the Combehe River Collective statement, they stated, and I quote, the need to develop a politics that was anti-racist, unlike those of white men, white women, and anti-sexist, unlike those of black and white men. Another um, quote coming from the uh, Combe River Collective statement, it spoke about their politics, and uh, quote, it goes, uh, the most general statement of our politics at the present time would be that we are actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual and class oppression and see as our particular task, the development of integrated analysis and practice based upon the fact that major systems of oppression are interlocking and that the syntheses of these oppressions create the conditions of our lives. One of the historical pioneers of intersectionality before that word was coined dates back to 1892 by Anna Julia Cooper. So Anna, she was a black woman. She was uh, born in North Carolina in 1858 and her parents were former slaves. 
So the first idea of intersectionality was published in one of her collection of essays in 1892, and it was called A Voice from the South. So in this essay, she states that, um, and I quote, the cause of freedom is not the cause of a race or a sect, a party or a class. It is the cause of humankind, the very birthright of humanity, not unless we are great, greatly mistaken, the reform of our day, known as the women's movement, is essentially such an embodiment, if its pioneers could only realize it. So in this, uh, Dr. Anna, she argues that uh, race and gender should not be overlooked, and that Black women have unique, have unique experiences that was best expressed by them. Also in uh, Julia's work, she calls out the white women's movement and how it was solely focused on gender and left out black women and women of color. Uh, this is also a quote from Anna Julia Cooper. Uh, and it goes, the colored woman of today occupies, one may say, a unique position in this country in a period of itself transitional, unsettled. Her status seems one of the least ascertainable and definitive of all the forces which make for our civilization. She is confronted by both a women question and a race problem. So we go on to define what is intersectionality. So we're gonna use um, the definition from Kimberly Crenshaw. And uh, that is that intersectionality takes into the account people's overlapping identities and experiences in order to understand the complexity of prejudice they face. So right now I actually have a little activity. Um, I don't wanna continue to bore you with my, uh, my voice today. So I just have a little activity here. So I'll just bring up the instructions to it. So if you can, if you can grab a sheet of paper or uh, you can open your notes on your phone or your computer. I want you to write down three to four different parts of your identity. I also um, included one as an example for myself. I'm an Afro-Caribbean, I'm also an immigrant, a uh, cis man, and a Bahamian. So I also left a little diagram here just to give you um, an idea of the different um, you know, intersections of our identities. So I'll give you about five, five to eight minutes to get that done, and then uh, we will come right back.
I'll uh, give you a few more minutes. All right, so I'll give you some minutes to write those things down. So, you know, as you look on that piece of paper, you can see that we are all more than one identity. And um, each one is interconnected, which creates a unique experience. For the next slide, we're gonna uh, look at what is DEI. So um, the de definition we have here is from Qualtrics. And uh, they go on here to say DEI stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, it's the umbrella term for the programs, policies, strategies, and practices that implement a co company's mission to create and sustain a diverse, equitable, inclusive environment that respects and accommodates every employee. So on the screen there, you can that is actually a definition um, of each of uh, the components of um, DEI. Uh, we got that from the University of Toronto. So to the section I'm sure everyone is here for is uh, um, we're going to look at the current state of DEI. So one of the things I've just started working in diversity, equity, inclusion for a little bit over two years now. And when I initially went into it, one of the common things that I've heard when I got into it was that there was a pressure to choose a niche. So when I say that, for example, you had to be a gender equity consultant, racial equity or disability equity consultant. So uh, while I begin reading and watching videos of DEI um, consultants, I understood the reasoning around picking a niche. Diversity is such a wide spectrum uh, Focusing on one is a huge undertaking. Something that you know many here probably heard on your own journey of education and formulating DEI agendas at your workplaces. But you know, as we discuss, we're human beings, we are complex, we are more than one identity. Each of our identities are interconnected. If that is race, if it's religion, class, gender, ethnicity, disability neurodiversity, education, et cetera. So by focusing on one thing, we completely remove many aspects of our identity and the unique experience that each characteristic brings. We will not be able to formulate policies, create initiatives and shift organizational culture. So the question we ask, will there be true equity? So, um, for example, um, many workplaces establish 
gender inclusion and diversity plans, um, which you know were created to ensure that women are present in positions of power and leadership. But uh, what um, we see from many organizations is that that stops at the sole representation of white cis women and disregards women of color, trans women, queer women, disabled and newer diverse women. This is one of the reasons intersectionality matters. So this is uh, the section here. Um, so I'm sure this is the section that um, everyone is really looking forward to of how to incorporate intersectionality in your DEI agenda. So uh, what I did, um, I split it into two main things. So the first one is to review cur your uh, current DEI plan and company policies, practices, and initiatives using an intersectional lens that is centered on lived experiences. So assess your current gender equity policies. Do they uh, explicitly include women of color, neurodiverse women, et cetera? Also evaluate your recruitment practices. Are they reaching a diverse audience? Um, one of the things I can remember back to actually Josh and his presentation that he had around uh, DEI, I think it was in October of last year, um, is um, I think uh, at the chamber, um, they uh, recognized the challenges that they had in um, catering to diverse um, clientele. So one of the things that uh, uh, the chamber did was that they reached out and partnered with an organization called Placemaking 4G. And they provided them with different resources and help um, and, and helping them with different ways in which they would be able to diversify um, their clientele. So um, that is a great organization um, that you can reach out to. Another organization that I can remember at the top of my head is also, is also um, Tribe Network. Um, so Tribe Network, um, you are able to, as an employee, an employer, you're able to go on their website. Um, you can post um, different jobs on their website and they have um, on their platform, they have hundreds of BIPOC um, individuals throughout, um, throughout Atlantic Canada. So that's, a, you know, different ways in which you can ensure that you have a diverse audience when you have, uh, when you are performing your recruitment uh, practices. So um, we want to make necessary changes to ensure that the policies are now reflective of an intersectional approach. So are those in leadership uh, reflective of the community that you serve? Are there pay gaps in your organization that goes beyond gender? So we wanna look at all of these different things and we wanna dissect that data to really understand like what is happening at your organization. Uh, the second one here is hire a third party DEI consultant to help audit policies, initiatives, and practices. So, you know, some things that we are blind to. And, you know, I think it is, a, you know, also a good way to get a new perspective and fresh set of eyes reviewing your policies and, you know, helping you with your EDI or DEI agenda. So those are the two um, things that I posted there uh, that you can do today um, to help um, um, incorporate intersectionality in your DEI agenda. So as a review, um, look critically and use the lens of intersectionality centered on lived experience to ensure barriers for various groups are eliminated. You know, one of the things we discussed earlier is that, you know, the current practice of choosing a niche. At Open Floor, we believe in the idea of centering the most marginalized group among us which will address the concerns of other marginalized groups. So, you know, as we leave today, I hope that everyone left with a greater understanding of intersectionality, of its, um, its importance in creating an holistic DEI blueprint. You know, we are consistently learning and the efforts of everyone here shows that each of us are on the right path of consistently making progress on a mission to create a more inclusive and equitable workplace. Questions?
Thank you so much for that presentation, Kendall. It was uh, truly informative. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just gonna start my video. It was very informative and I do have, I, I am gonna steal an opportunity for a question of my own while folks uh, have a chance to kind of wrangle their thoughts. Um, I'm, I'm wondering how might an employer or you know maybe a staff member or maybe just a general friend or colleague um, how might they, what's a cue um, for them to understand when the intersectionality is at play in the everyday life or in the workforce? Or, um, you know, maybe when, I guess, if you could provide an example of how uh, intersectionality may show up in the workplace, um, you know, whether it's uh, maybe it's, um, you know, a problematic uh, scenario or maybe it's a, um, a positive scenario. Um, I'm wondering if you could just provide an example of how it may kind of uh, look um, in the workplace. Um, let me just can, can you just like uh, say the question a little bit, a little bit more. Uh... Yeah, I'm. I'm just. I guess more generally, how how might intersectionality show up uh, as a uh, as an employee or for an employee rather in the workplace? All right. I guess one of the first things I would um, think of is um, we can go back into the uh, recruitment process. Um, I know. Um, when we look at recruitment, I remember, um, I think it was over like two years ago or so, I attended an event with SMU and they had their um, Indigenous student, student um, rep speaking. And one of the things that um, he spoke about was about the interview process and how um, I think, you know, we are in a Western society and we have a lot of Western ideals when it comes to interviews. And one of the things he spoke about is understanding cultures. Um, so for instance, um, for in a lot of indigenous um, communities, looking um, directly eye to eye contact um, is, especially when it's a person who is, um, I would say in a higher position, um, that is something that in some indigenous cultures um, that you wouldn't do. And some other cultures, some Asian cultures are um, similar. Um, so I think for us is really understanding the cultural aspect of these different things as well when it comes to how we are doing the interview process. Um, another thing, you know, as I spoke about is um, in terms of leadership, um, in terms of um, having, um, you know, different points of saying we want to have uh, 35, 40, 55% of our leadership that are women. Um, one of the things that um, it, from a lot of organizations that I've seen is that it just stops at just looking at um, white women and not looking at other um, other marginalized groups, uh, women of color, looking at um, disabled women, um, uh, neurodiverse women, um, trans women, et cetera. So I think like uh, most of those different things, if we use an, a lens of intersectionality, we can kind of root out those different things of are we actually, um, are we actually putting um, goals that are impacting diverse communities and diverse demographics. Makes sense. Um, maybe uh, maybe the answer, answer to this question is quite simply um, educating yourself, but how might an employer or how might a friend um, kind of, how might they uh, begin to make themselves aware of all the different intersectionalities that make up uh, the person whom they're speaking with, whom they have a relationship with, and how might they be able to better um, you know, spot these cues out when they're at play? I guess uh, the first thing would be, you know, just asking a question. Um, I know, you know, just, just going up and just asking um, uh, the individual who you're speaking to, even if it just goes on, um, just to, to understand who that person is. Um, I know that um, it can be kind of... Uh, I don't know, kind of difficult in some ways um, when speaking about different things, just understanding what can I say, what can I not say, but, you know, especially when it comes to, let's look at pronouns. I think uh, just by, you know, not assuming someone's pronouns, but by asking someone, you know, how should I address you would be, you know, a way that, you know, you can introduce, um, you know, have that conversation. Makes sense. Just as simple as that, I think starting the convo is the probably the first uh, the first step. 
Um, okay, we have a few questions rolling in. Uh, what are some ways individuals can support their coworkers who are a part of a minority group community without putting the work on them? All right, that's a good question. So, you know, seeking that in information, um, educating yourself, I think is a, a, a good thing. Um, one of the things I know, uh, one of the, I read um, an article some years ago and it spoke about allyship and it was written by an indigenous person right here in Canada. And I thought it was very interesting because they compared allyship and to becoming accomplice, right? And what that was talking about is being an ally is more of like, hey, I'm gonna be here to help you. But being an accomplice is more like, hey, let's do this together. Um, you know, we, you know, you know, this is more about let's um, both, you know, get, get into this and work on something together rather than that individual extending their hand and saying, like, I'm gonna help you or show the way. I think, um, you know, in uh, being uh, in um, employee, you know, being, um, you know, speaking with your colleague, um, I think that is one of the things that we can do seeking that information. There's so many different resources out there, gathering that information, not putting that emotional labor onto that individual, but looking to see like, where can I be able to find these different, um, um, where can I inform and educate myself? Makes sense. And, you know, so often it can be, um, you know, there's a fine line between maybe projecting some of the, the stereotypical kind of, um, thinking of, of, of what a, per, a person from a, a underserved community may be thinking or experiencing versus just asking. And, and if I'm hearing correctly, um, just starting the conversation and, and, and asking where, where I might be able to support is, is maybe the key, the key point there. Yeah, I would say. Okay. Um, okay. One other one. Uh, how do we get our entire team on board thinking differently and, and uh, more aware? All right. So I know that is something that has been, um, you know, from the people I've spoken to is kind of a tough point. But I think the conversations need to be had. Um, it's going to be very uncomfortable situations speaking about um, um, uh, systemic issues within your organization. But I think with, um, I think um, as leaders, we should, um, we are the, you know, the first, um, we should be introducing these different things. We should um, be accountable and transparent and as we introduce our DEI agendas and plans. And I think it starts with educa education. It starts with also um, admitting that, you know, there are areas within our organization that we need to work on and um, having those um, conversations with other leaders um, to ensure that there is a consensus among people within the room that, uh, you know, things we need to put in place to, you know, to create a more um, inclusive and equitable organization. Um, but I, you know, I know that um, I, from my point of view, I feel that, um, you know, we want to um, have people within our organization, especially within leadership, who are receptive of this, um, who, um, you know, who are receptive um, and who, um, and, and, and who are um, able to change um, their ways of thinking. Makes sense. Um, I think there's one other one that just came in. Do you have any tips on ways to proactively source uh, job candidates for hiring from underrepresented communities? In this online world, do we believe designated positions are enough? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, as I stated, um, two organizations I can just name off my head is Placemaking 4G. They have really great resources, really great personnel, and sourcing out diverse audiences. And, you know, the same with Tribe Network. I know that um, employers are able to, you know, post different job postings there. And they have hundreds of people within the BIPOC community that are on the platform. So, you know, these are some ways that we can, you know, be more connected and have diverse range of of, 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 of um, um, recruitment um, um, personnel. So I think like those different things of having those conversations with um, organizations such as those, I think that would be a great resource. And I mean, that's something that, um, you know, at the end of this, um, uh, this webinar series that I can put 
um, a list of different resources, also with some of the links, uh, the citations of the work that we um, presented here today, in which you can take a look, you can reach out to Placemaking 4G or Tribe Network and see exactly what they can do and help you with your recruitment needs. Nice. And uh, I guess another question from myself, um, do you have any tips on uh, so often, you know, the, the cases that uh, folks, businesses, organizations who uh, really want to connect and learn about different communities and cultures don't uh, necessarily have the uh, direct access as someone who uh, uh, maybe is from is from one of those communities. And so how might um, how would you suggest folks go about maybe um, introducing those conversations about, you know, working collaboratively with collabor collaboratively, sorry, um, with different communities and just general kind of engagement kind of um, uh, best practices, I guess. Okay. Um, trying to think. Uh, I think, I think I would answer this. <laughs> Like for an example, um, you know, maybe uh, and maybe instead of uh, like reaching out uh, initially via email to an organization to help you with your own agenda, maybe you could go to one of this uh, organization's events and connect on the ground floor with someone in person and and show a, uh, you know, sh show a more in um, aligned kind of uh, uh, agenda with with their mission instead of uh, solely making it your own. How you know things like that? How might folks um? engage with various communities in a, in a genuine way? I think, I think that is a great point. I think you can you know, reach out to these different organizations. Um, you can reach out to the different events that these organizations are having and start by creating relationships with those personnel at that point. You know, just, you know, there's, you know, so many um, um, events that are happening that are shared across LinkedIn on, um, Instagram, but just, you know, going into these events, creating that relationship with these personnel. And, um, you know, I think that would be the best place to start. Makes sense. And, and like Kendall mentioned, there's, there's, a, you know, so many different organizations and people um, involved in the DEA and I space and community engagement space that you can uh, uh, reach out to and connect with. Uh, many of them are also chamber members, including Kendall. Um, so be sure to always, um, always stay in the know, do the research, like with any other kind of, you know, basic business principle, it's important to stay up to date on, um, you know, new, new insights, best practices, and, and, and how to, uh, you know, how to drive uh, the, that bottom line and, and ultimately um, increase your, uh, your um, relationships with, with all of the, the communities in which you serve. And so um, it's so important to stay in the know. Um, any other final questions before we wrap things up and we'll end a bit early. Um, so I'm sure folks will be uh, happy about that. Um, but any final questions? Okay, if I see, if I, oh, nope, just some thank yous. Lots of thank yous coming in, Kendall. So uh, I guess without further ado, I wanna thank everyone for attending today's webinar. You are truly making a difference here in our community just by educating yourself. So thank you for that. Um, Kendall, thank you so much for taking the time to share this knowledge with us. We are truly appreciative of it. Um, and for folks, if you wanna reach out to Kendall and his team at Open Floor Consulting, please do. As you see, there's a free 30 minute consultation. It's a great place to start. Um, or if you've already started, it's just another touch point, more expertise you can add to the uh, to the um, portfolio. So uh, please reach out to Kendall if you have any questions, if you're curious, um, be sure to do that. Um, and today's webinar will be recorded. It'll probably be on our YouTube channel by the end of the week. Um, so be sure to share it with a friend if you if you found it insightful, if you found it informative. Um, and like I said, if you want to learn more about this topic or engage Kendall to help with your practices, reach out. Um, the Chamber has a bunch of events on the horizon this month and the next. And so um, we are hosting an event coming up on February 21st with uh, BNI at the Black Cultural Center. Um, and so this will be a speed networking event 
while you'll also get to take in all the amazing culture that exists and the history um, that exists within the Black Cultural Center. So if you've never been, um, that'll be exciting. Hope to see you there. Um, we're also hosting another webinar next week focused on um, accessing funding for new talent. So it's kind of fitting if you're looking to build a more diverse team, um, that'll be something you'll want to tune into. That'll be taking place on February 16th. Um, also, there's a bunch of events happening this month and for Black History Month. Uh, be sure to visit the Black Cultural Center or the Halifax Public Library's calendar um, to see all the events that are taking place and how you can celebrate and honor the amazing month in culture and history that we have here in Nova Scotia. As I mentioned, this webinar was recorded and will be available to everyone on, on uh, YouTube shortly. Um, and so without further ado, I want to say thanks again to our presenter and all of you and enjoy the rest of your day um, and continue to make impact within your organizations and communities. Thanks everyone.